This passage, so many questions you need to ask yourself when you read this. I like asking questions. It's important to ask questions. Some people think questions are annoying and you shouldn't ask questions and you shouldn't doubt, but I think that's rubbish. I think the more questions you ask, the better. And uh, asking good questions is really important. And in fact, in Jewish culture, if you um, asked really good questions, you were someone who actually knew what you were talking about. Because it wasn't about being able to recite information that you had memorized. It was about being able to ask good questions to keep the conversation flowing, to keep the question and the conversation about God continuing. So when you were tested and examined, you didn't give answers, you asked questions. So questions are really, really important. And one of the questions we need to ask in this passage is why did Jesus need a donkey? Why not a horse? Why not a camel, which you thought might be, you know, rather apt, considering that, you know, um, that, that's possibly what the three wise men, you know, rode to his birth. They rode camels. That was the, the form of transport for a lot of people. Why a donkey? Well, if you look at the commentaries, they'll tell you that a donkey was a symbol of peace in those days. Whereas if someone rode in on a horse, they would be a conquering general who rode in on a horse to show how tough and mighty he was. The donkey was a symbol of peace, and horses were a symbol of military might. Conquering generals came on horses. An ambassador coming on a peaceful mission rode a donkey. Jesus was an ambassador of peace for the ultimate kingdom. And it also needed to fulfill the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9, that the Messiah would come into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Jesus pre-planned this stuff. It didn't happen by accident. It wasn't just something that happened. The Bible says that he went ahead and prepared the way. Who's to say that he hadn't already arranged with the donkey owner? I mean, let's face it, if somebody just says, oh, the master needs it, you wouldn't just go, yeah, okay, then, fine. You know, um, you know we're just taking your Porsche, is that all right? The pastor needs it. Oh, yeah, sure, no worries, that's fine. So I'm sure that the reading that we between the lines that we can do from this passage where Jesus went ahead was that he had prearranged some of these things, found out, spoke to them, said, is this okay, and allowed it to happen. Now, one of the interesting things, though, too, is what is the, the, the crowd was singing as Jesus was coming in? The crowd was singing part of the great psalm of praise, Psalm 118, that pilgrims always sang on the way into Jerusalem. It's a song of victory, a hymn of praise to God who defeats all his foes and establishes his kingdom. That's from one of the commentaries. This is part of what they read out. This is part of the psalm from Psalm 118. I'll just read three verses of it. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm sure you've heard all heard that song before. And that's where the song comes from, is from this psalm. Please, Lord, save us. Please, Lord, give us success. Bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. It's a psalm of celebration for the king. People often will try and argue that Jesus never said that he was king. But yet he rode into town on a donkey, showing that he was an ambassador of peace, fulfilling a, prof a prophecy by Zechariah that was written way before him, allowing people to sing songs of praises to the king and treating him like he was royal. He was well and truly saying, yes, I am the king, but maybe not the kind of king that you're expecting. Maybe not the kind of king that you actually think that you need. And that's what he was showing them in this place. We all want celebration. Celebration is a great thing. We celebrated Tunde's birthday earlier. Celebration is important. But I was taught very early on in life that often with celebration, comes trial and sometimes with celebration comes tragedy as well. The reason that celebrations are so great is because it's often come after some difficulty. You'll often see that when writers produce a movie and put a movie together, you'll see lots of um, terrible things happening to someone. So at the end when they're vindicated or they win or whatever, the celebration is all the more great. The celebration is all the more wonderful because of all the difficult things that they've gone through in the past. And all they're doing is reflecting what actually goes on in life, what actually goes on in day-to-day -day life in a normal situation. We all want celebration, but with celebration comes 
the recognition that there's also suffering and trials in life. With a wedding, that's a great celebration, comes the work of marriage that lasts a lifetime. With a birthday, comes the recognition of another year of passing. With baptism, often comes spiritual attack and feelings of uh, abandonment and loneliness as well. If you've ever gone through a baptism, you'll know that that can quite often follow the celebration of your baptism. I remember such an event in my life when I was ordained back in August 2008. I'd already been a pastor for four years um, while I completed what was necessary to become ordained. So you can be a pastor and then kind of like an apprentice, you're finishing off the rest of your work to be completely ordained and have the boxes ticked that you need to tick. I had to complete the work that was necessary for the ordination. It was a culmination of a journey which took eight years. There was many hurdles. There was things like acceptance into theological college when I didn't even finish high school, passing my studies when I didn't even finish high school, finding a mentor that could train me to be a pastor, being called by a church, which is an important um, recommendation. If you're going to be ordained, you actually have to have the people of God call you to be a pastor. You can't just say, I'm a pastor and not have a church. So you had to actually have a group of people to call you as a pastor. And then being recognized by my entire denomination as someone who is worthy to be trained and to lead a church. This whole journey began at the end of last century. We can say that now. It's 20 years ago. 1999, 20 years ago, this whole journey began for me. It was a long time. And a pastor of mine, a dear mentor, he was my pastor as I grew up in church from a little boy all the way through. And he was a dear mentor of mine. I remember distinctly, he used to always stand at the door and shake your hand. And he had this great way of shaking your hand and pushing you out the door as he shook your hand as well. It's quite, quite a neat trick that I've never been able to uh, emulate since. But a uh, lovely man. And one day when I was 16 years old, he grabbed my hand and instead of pushing me out the door, he grabbed my hand, pulled me in close and said, Marcus, God's got something in store for you. And I was like, okay, I'm 16, but all right, whatever you say. No worries, Malcolm. Um, and didn't think anything much more of it from there on in. But sometime later, many years later, in 1999, he was discipling me and he said that uh, he believed that God was calling me to be a pastor. I thought he was nuts, but I uh, trusted him enough to listen. We journeyed and prayed about it over a few months. And I objected because I was nothing like him. He's a pastor and he's a lovely, lovely guy. Um, Malcolm's the kind of person who was the gentlest, nicest person. He, would, he couldn't harm a dandelion, let alone a fly. He was just such a lovely person. And I thought, I'm just nothing like him. I, I'm probably a little bit more like James and John, you know, the sons of thunder. And so I can, you know, don't tend to uh, do things the way that you expect people to do them. And then I also compared that to my brother. And my brother is a pastor too. Now, my brother is a lovely guy. I love him to bits, but he's very different to me. He's the um, on fire, in your face, sharing the gospel with you on the plane, kind of let's talk about Jesus and he's really like the extrovert of the family and I thought, I'm nothing like him and I'm nothing like Malcolm and they're my two images of what a pastor should be. And I thought, well, I can't be that and I can't be that, so I'm not a pastor, that's not going to happen. So I didn't think that it was actually that accurate but I trusted Malcolm enough to go through the process. Now my siblings and I grew up in a home where individuality was emphasized and encouraged. This, we all have a very strong sense of health, very, very strong sense of who we are as individuals. We know who we are and how we are shaped by God. I'm the youngest of five and we're all taught to be who God made us to be. My parents were very unusual because they were Germans and they were very clear on the fact that we are not to fit in. My father had written in his Bible a Dr. Zeus quote that says, stand out, don't fit in. And that's something that he learnt in English that he had written into his Bible. He praised individuality because he grew up in an era where you all had to fit the same mould. Everybody had to act the same way and look the same way and do what you were told and do the job that you were told to do. In fact, they moved to Australia to give their five children the opportunity to be everything God made them to be so that they didn't have to fit into anybody else's view of what you should be growing up. We never heard, why can't you be more like your siblings? We were encouraged to find our own path in life. In fact, 
as I said, that's one of the reasons my parents made the choice to come to Australia. So when Malcolm told me that I was being called to be a pastor, I thought, well, that's impossible because we're all individuals and my brother's the pastor, so therefore, I'm not like my brother, so I can't be a pastor. So I don't know where you're coming with this, Malcolm, but you've got to be pretty wrong. And then Malcolm told me something that stuck with me ever since. And it's something that I've pretty much got engraved in my brain. And it's something that's found that has been true words for me for my entire life. He said, Marcus, if God calls you to be a pastor, he's calling you to be you. Not to be me, not to be your brother Thomas, not to be Rick Warren, not to be anyone else. You are Marcus, and God needs you to be Marcus to whoever he calls you to be. And you need to be the best Marcus you can be, and you need to work on that to make sure that you improve and that you're getting better. But you are not to be like everyone else. You need to stand out, not fit in, because God has made you uniquely and individually, and he wants you to be the pastor that you've been called. And I couldn't argue with him. <laughs> I couldn't argue with that. So this long and sometimes arduous journey, and it's a much longer story than this, and I'm cutting it short for you, we had to go through Bible college where not only did we not get any benefits from the government to help us to study, we also had to pay for the private college fees to be able to study at theological college. My wife and I decided to have a family at the same time. So we're basically both unemployed students um, having, raising a family and studying at Bible college and trusting God that we'll all work out okay. And you know what? It did. We paid all our bills. The children always had nappies. There was always food on the table. There was always a roof over our heads. God always provided for us. That doesn't mean that it was always easy, but God always provided for us. And then we got to the celebration of my ordination. And you'd think you finally get to the end, and that's it. That's, that's the a celebratory moment. Uh, it's a, an ordination for us in the Baptist circles. It's not about hierarchy. It's not about giving you a title. It's about saying, we accept that you know what you're doing and that we accept that you should be a pastor and that God has called you to do this. And then all the people there are acknowledging that's what God's doing in your life. It doesn't raise you any higher than everyone else. It doesn't put you in any kind of hierarchy. It's just an acceptance of where you're at and accepting who you are as a person. And I, you'd think that you could get to that point and just be able to rest on your laurels and celebrate. But the president of the denomination preached a sermon at that uh, ordination service, and I distinctly remember it, and he said, now is when the trials and the hard work begins. Now is where it all, the rubber starts to hit the road, as the terminology said. Now is when you're actually going to have to face some of the things that are going to be the most difficult things that you can face. And that has stuck with me ever since. With ministry comes expectations that you will never, ever live up to. Now, why do I share all of this? Well, in this gospel, we're reminded that Jesus also had a long journey to get to his celebration. He suffered rejection, plots, temptations, and now he's being celebrated as he comes into Jerusalem and they're waving branches and throwing their coats on the road and saying, here comes the king. But this celebration to us seems hollow. And it would have been for Luke who wrote it as well because he obviously wrote it after the fact and knew what happened a week later. Because we know what the future holds for Jesus in just less than a week's time. There are people celebrating who will betray him. There are people celebrating who will deny him. There are people celebrating who have traveled with him every day for the past three years who will abandon him. There are people celebrating who might quite likely be the same people screaming, crucify him, on Friday. It's easy for us to say, well, we wouldn't do that if we were there because we love Jesus and we would never, ever do that ourselves. We, we will follow him all the days of our lives and we're all like Peter and we want to say, no way, Lord, that's not going to happen to you because we're going to be with you. I'll never deny you. And God says to Peter, by the time this day's over, you're going to deny me, not once, but three times. Again, in Jewish law or Jewish understanding, three is a number of completeness. So if you 
betray someone three times, you've completely betrayed them. You've completely given up everything and betrayed them. So three was a really important number. And Peter completely betrayed Jesus. But what drives us to do these things, to lose faith, to deny, betray, and call for blood? What, do, what did not call us to do these things? The expectations that they placed on Jesus as he came into Jerusalem. Because what did they expect from a king? This time it's not a rhetorical question. What would they have expected from a king coming in to an occupied country, occupied by the Romans? Anyone? Deliver them from the Romans. Kick those nasty Romans out of our town. Give us our town back. Let us worship at the temple in peace. Let's get rid of those guys who are oppressing us. Rome brought peace, the Pax Ramona, the peace of Rome, and they brought it underneath the boots and with a sword and with a spear and with armies and with wars. And Jesus said, that's not how my kingdom operates. They expected the Romans to be booted out by this king coming in. They didn't pick up on everything that Jesus had told them about what was going to happen and what the future held. They had an expectation that Jesus was going to get rid of the Romans. He tells them that his kingdom is a kingdom of love, a kingdom where the weak are made strong and the most undesirable people, the Samaritans, they're our neighbours. No one wants that. Now, we all have expectations of what Christianity should look like. We all have ideas of what respectable people look like as well. We all have expectations of what our church should look like. However, often our expectations don't fit God's plan for his kingdom. And most importantly, are we ready to follow him when everyone around us is calling for our blood and we're going through trials and despair? It's easy to follow God when you get the parking space in front of the shop that you prayed for. It's easy to follow God when the bank account's full and there's food in the fridge and everyone in your family is healthy and the, your husband just got a promotion at work and you've just got a promotion too and your kids are going to the best universities. Boy, it's easy to follow Jesus when all that stuff's happening. Praise the Lord! But are we also willing to praise the Lord when the fridge is bare, when you've just lost your job, when your husband's business has just... Uh, gone bankrupt when your children are failing at school and your daughter's just come home and said she's pregnant and your son is um, off with his mates and you know that they're taking drugs. How easy is it to follow Jesus then? Like David in the Psalms, every trial he faced, he turned to God. I love reading the Psalms. I read Psalms every day. I have a Bible reading uh, plan that I go through, um, created by the Moravian Church. You can Google it if you want to. It's just a way of saying, here's some passages to read for the day. And uh, it always includes a psalm, an Old Testament passage, and a New Testament passage. And I love the psalms, because no matter what you're going through, there's something in the psalms for you. If you're celebrating because life is good, there's stuff in the psalms for you. If you're in despair because life is awful and it sucks at the moment, well, there's something in the psalms for you. But everything that David says in those Psalms, he always ends with, but Lord, I know you've got the right thing in store for me. But I know you're going to be there to protect me. I know you're going to help me through this trial. Or I thank you for this wonderful thing that you've just given me. He acknowledges God in everything he does. Was David a good example of a Christian man? No. He had an affair and then killed the husband of the woman he had an affair with. Or had him killed. Not really good an example of a Christian man. However, he was known as a man after God's own heart. Why? Because he repented of those things and always sought God in every other aspect of his life. He made mistakes and he knew it, but he always focused on God and what God had in store for him. Are we ready to follow Jesus in every circumstance? That's the question that Palm Sunday should bring to us. It's great that we have a celebration and sing Hosanna and as we should because Jesus is king. Amen? Jesus is king. 
you know, he's risen from the dead, we know that, we're going to celebrate Good Friday and we're going to leave it hanging on Good Friday, but on Easter Sunday we're going to celebrate the fact that Jesus rose again and that we are now all together with him in one body, that's all fantastic. But are we ready to follow him through every circumstance in our life? I want to read you something from uh, one of my favourite um, authors who is a, a commentary writer and he says it like this, as we arrive at Jerusalem with Jesus, the question presses upon us, are we going along for the trip in the hope that Jesus will fulfill some of our hopes and desires? Are we ready to sing a psalm of praise, but only as long as Jesus seems to be doing what we want? The long and dusty pilgrim way of our lives gives most of us plenty of time to sort out our motives for following Jesus in the first place. Are we ready not only to spread our cloaks on the road in front of him, to do the showy and flamboyant thing, but also now to follow him into trouble, controversy, trial and death? Do we decide to only follow Jesus in the triumph? That's a good question. And not one I'm going to give you an answer to because I think questions are important. Do we only decide to follow Jesus through triumph or do we follow him in the trials and the difficulties also? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you gave us your word. You gave us your word to sharpen us as iron sharpens iron. You gave us your word to encourage us, to challenge us, to push us on to better things, to help us to be the people you made us to be. Lord, we pray that as we go away and we contemplate this passage for this week as we lead into Good Friday, we pray that you remind us what it is that you've called us to, so that even when we struggle and face the difficult times of our lives, that you are there with us. Your rod and your staff, you comfort us. And you guide us through death's dark veil and lead us to the green pastures and still waters. Help us, Lord, to remember that you are there through those difficulties. Lord, we praise you and we celebrate you mightily on this day. And we say Hosanna as well, the coming king, the king who came and brought your kingdom on earth. We believe that kingdom is now. The kingdom is now and it is yet to be completed when your son returns to judge the living and the dead. But right now we can play a part in that kingdom. Right now you have called us to be a part of that wherever we are, with our families, with our neighbours, with our work colleagues, with our friends. Guide us, we pray, into this coming week to be the people that you want us to be. Help us to be hands and feet of you in the communities that we're in so that we can show your love to those around us. Help us to do what is right. Help us to do what is righteous and holy. Help us to do things your way, not our way. We pray these things in your name. Amen.